Uh, you're pretty quiet now, Mike. Yeah. Am I? That's probably for the best, to be honest. <laughs> that I will go. I'll you tell were you what. Quiet last week. As yeah, in not saying much, or as in just like low yeah, volume. Yeah, you didn't say much. You didn't say much. No, your 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 volume was great. Your opinions were quiet. <laughs> Useless. Were, <laughs> well, I hadn't played the game, which the internet, which which the comments didn't like very much. Which, is fair which enough. I, I get it. What a great! I love seeing our thread blow up when all of a sudden you hit just a magical moment in the game, and and all you had to do was put in two words, and we knew exactly where you were. It's so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alana. Yes, 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 yes. Hi, coffee buddy. Hey. No, put your hey. down. Put I down. made it fresh. Hey, just hey for Austin. This. Hey. hey, Austin. <laughs> Here's we'll Mike. Our... Yeah. Hello, everyone. We have our things to another too. episode of Playwatch. Listen, I'm <laughs> Alana. I am joined by video game composer Austin Wintery. I always forget the order. It's T next, video game actor Troy Baker, and video game director, who is also a coder because we got more criticism that we don't have anyone who knows how to program. Mike yeah. Bithel doesn't Why is do that? that. Yeah, his <laughs> first code. job is now a, a, a keystroke. <laughs> it's apparently game director isn't impressive enough. It's not a, It's not good enough. Doesn't span enough locations. I think this is the first. Locations. <laughs> This is the first author. time where it's it is A A T M exactly on my oh, you're right. on my screen. Not on mine. Yeah, it is for me too. It goes <laughs> we oh, fucking hell. This. A this again. A T. I feel like we do this every week. Anyway, listen to the uh, watch the video version, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we make a lot of references. Yeah. Um. So today Troy's I wanted to talk about. doing weird shit with about... his hands. <laughs> what now? What now? Whoa, what now? Spotify. <laughs> 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 um, I wanted to talk about, I feel like a lot of people are talking about it right now, and I think the conversation might have been sparked in part because there's a former Sony executive who said, video games are too long. Um, this is a thing that I feel like comes up all the time, depending on Grr. what you're doing in life. I feel like parents especially are like, why they make the video game too long? Um, mm. But this was specifically uh, uh, Sean Layden. So it's not mm. like it, you know, wasn't someone um, who said he would welcome the return of the 12 to 15 hour game. I would finish more games, first of all, just like a well-edited piece of literature or a movie. I've been looking at the discipline around that, the containment around that. It could get us tighter, more compelling content. It would be something I'd like to see a return to. And I've actually felt for a while that the impact of services like Game Pass is probably uh, going to be that we do see some shorter games come to those services because it's kind of more of a risk. Um, did come out in news this week. Uh, Mike Rose at No More Robots uh, said that Descenders, which is a game I found on Game Pass and really love, sold three times as well after they put it on Game Pass, meaning it's just that exposure. Mm. A lot more people know that game exists. Uh, but that is, in theory, a short game that works very well for the Game Pass formula. I also played Abzu on Game Pass uh, and then bought it when it came up. Um, but it does seem I like we've got we've that... got similar boosts. Sorry, we've got similar boosts on Thomas was alone. I think as oh, well. When we we're in Game Pass. Yeah, I think we. I don't know if we ever said that publicly, but yeah, I think we've we've seen it when you give away something for free. Turns out people talk about it. It's how know. Rocket League took off. The Mac mm. became huge. Bioshock did the majority of its sale uh, sales when it went on as a Steam sale, and it actually made more money, even though they like way lower the price. And interesting thing that Ken Levine taught me was that he was like, there is a barrier to where once you go below this rate this this number any further discount is negligible yeah. so he was like we put it to this and the majority it, it went from like i don't know four million five million copies that it did to like something like rocketing over like seven or eight it was it was ridiculous. Do you mean for infinite specifically infinite specifically interesting yeah. i know um yeah, no. that was my, a late um, steam sales like a fall so it wasn't like oh. july or whatever my mm. pals over at uh, Supergiant said that when bastion first came out um it was not a hit out of the gate at all. And they were basically like, oh, we're, we might be screwed. And funny enough, <clears> the the high engagement rate on the soundtrack album, especially through Bandcamp, Darren Korb's um, yeah. kick-ass soundtrack, that, that actually that actually was some useful uh, quick quick uh, access revenue for the company hmm. uh, because, you know, you have, you have basically instant access to revenue through – uh, Bandcamp sales, and they were seeing a, a high um, percentage of people play the game who would then get the album. But then I think he said it came out in like uh, March or something of that year. But it was um, like the Halloween I Steam it was on sale. Summer of, summer of Xbox. I thought it was on the. It was definitely on the Xbox. That's how I got it. It may. Uh, it may summer have been. of Arcade. That's what. It's yeah. It, yeah. It, so whatever it was, it was. I think the fall Steam sale or something that triggered it to just absolutely explode mm -hmm. and mm. then you know and it's still it's still i mean as big of a hit as transistor 
uh, was, which I think was an even bigger hit. I think like day by day, Bastion is still like doing respectable numbers. And it was that initial like critical mass of people that the sale got. Um, no way. It's yep. crazy. I had no idea. It's one of those that you remember it. You re you recanonize that as like Bastion. Once Instant a hit, hit, always a hit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, not Thomas was alone made more money. Sorry, Thomas was alone made less money in its first six months on sale than the week after that. So it's, wow. it's like, yeah. Wow. Because it was very, in, it was in a sale very and a couple of YouTubers. Yeah, it's 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 huh. it's like Austin says. After the fact, we always go. Well, obviously, Thomas was alone right out the gate. Everyone loved it. it I Megan thought hit. it was. I thought it was like this. Instant. I didn't quit my job. I didn't quit my job until yeah, until about seven months after Thomas was alone came out. I released Thomas was alone, and I went back to work and basically like was like, well, I guess you know I'll try and make another indie game in a few years or something. And it no was way. it took like six months for it to get there. Yeah. <laughs> the but we, wow. we always we, it's it's exactly what austin says we recontextualize things to with with you know with hindsight to oh it was obvious there was always going to be a, a thing you know hmm. i i feel like hmm. um we could have a whole episode about that but yeah leading from the <laughs> conversation about game pass and, and sales is like my my thought process is i feel like the way that xbox at least and, and that means that probably other people are doing it and just not being as obvious about it uh, are approaching the next generation is very much focused on that subscription service rather than being focused on hardware or exclusives. Not that they don't have exclusives too, but that m makes me think that yes, this is going to change the landscape and that maybe people will start making shorter games to put on Game Pass um, mm -hmm. because I feel like it is sort of a bit more of a financial risk uh, to put something on there knowing that is really their drive because obviously that's on PC too and it's such a good service. If you don't have Game Pass, it's, it's, it's very, very good. It's absolutely worth it. Um, but Mike, you're a person that I did want to talk to about this. What's the longest game that you've made? <laughs> I don't know. It might have been John Wick, actually. I think I think that clocks in about six hours. So our stuff is really short, yeah. So when like, you approach how long the games you're making are, is that a number that you have from the start? Literally, how do you decide, or how does that come <laughs> about, the length of a video game? I think for us, it's usually like an arbitrary thing that we just we pick a number and then run towards that and, and then adjust as we go on. So Interesting. Like with Thomas was alone, there's a hundred levels and Thomas was alone. The only reason is it's a nice round number. And then as we did it, that kind of made sense with, with John Wick, I think very early on Austin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we worked out like there are going to be it's seven locations in John Wick. Like there's going to be seven locations, but then there was a lot of back and forth on like, how big do we, how long do we spend in each location? How big is a level? Um, for me though, yeah, our stuff, our games as well vary in price a lot. So we've done like five dollar games, ten dollar games, twenty dollar games, um, and I think that impacts it for sure. Like there's definitely a correlation, like what you can get away with in a five dollar game versus what you can do in twenty dollars. And I assume, obviously, if if we ever did do like a sixty dollar game, those expectations would 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 shoot up again. You know, are you saying um, specifically <clears throat> for time? Like like you, I can I can get away with. I know by now I've made enough games to know that. Mm. Each hour per game, I can quantify dollar wise, month wise, resource wise. I think yeah, wise. yeah. Historically, okay. it feels like there's been like a dollar value people want to spend for an hour of an indie game. That's but I'm saying for you though, like to make. Well, it, yeah, though. no, that's yeah. Oh, oh, to make it for the return. No, so the the. So what? Which do you mean? Do you mean like in terms of like the cost per hour of making? Yeah, a like game, I can or? look at a film and say on average for per five minutes of film, there's about eight mm. hours of filming, right? On a movie oh, set. Oh, I see what you're saying. So if you no, look at that and go, yeah. per hour of gameplay, I'm looking at three months of dev with 12 people at an average burn rate of $30,000 a month or whatever. Can, are you able to quantify there's some, that? There's some of that. It's weird in the, it's there's a weird kind of, there's two questions there because <laughs> to use your movie analogy, you're both making the movie, but you're also making the, the VCR. Oh, that's a old... Wow. Play or whatever. Hey, Dad. Like you're making you're you're making for those who have Max. never heard of this Jurassic technology <laughs> uh, amongst our listeners. Like so, to use an example of like a AAA game, right? You've got to make all of the systems and all of the structure of a AAA game, and all of the AI, all of the combat mechanics, ev everything that is how you play that game. Right. That's job one, and then job two is all the content. And what's weird is because of the way games are made, frankly, and so that they get shipped in anything approaching like a reasonable amount of time, you tend to do those two things simultaneously, which is the worst way of doing it. But like often you've got no choice. You Otherwise it would take 15 years to make a video game. So what you have this weird situation where you're kind of, 
those things are running in parallel and that's one of the reasons there's been a, i remember when this when this when this uh this games are too long for the kind of conversation came up in my feed there are lots of developers saying it doesn't take half as long to make a game that's half as long to play right it takes the same amount of time because you have to make if, if it's got the mechanical depth like you know to, to use Last of Us because we have become the unofficial Last of Us podcast. Like, <laughs> I remember reading about the first game, and Troy, you can tell me if this is true. The AI for the for the basically for any moment where an AI was NPC was running alongside you and was cooperating with you in the space, that was only finalized like months before ship. Yep, it was. So it was one hundred percent broken. It was one hundred percent broken. Um, and having and- worked on games with similar mechanics that have come in that hot as well, like it's. That means, by definition, to make all of those mechanics, you couldn't have made Last of Us faster. Probably there are uh, without changing, you know, efficiencies in production, different management pros. Like there, there's ways you can change how games are made, but it's not a simple matter of if you make the game half the length, it takes half as long to make. Interesting. The the team that was making that content for Last of Us were making that over here, and there's there's still influence because I mean I worked I remember working on a game called um, Dead to Rights uh, years yeah. and years and years ago. And that had a level where that basically that game you always you're you're a badass cop with a with a dog who runs alongside you in missions. We had uh, one level where you were accompanied by a human NPC, and they had to you know similar similar to how Last of Us does it. They're kind of providing support and, and trying not to look stupid, which is the main job of any companion NPC in a video game. Right. And I remember that was coming in similarly hot, and that meant that those of us who were working, I was working briefly, but other people were more responsible on the levels where that character was present. We were cheating all over the place to try and fake anything we could that made it not look bad. And then when the when the AI guys kind of figured it out towards the end and everything kind of came in, then there was a mad scramble to like <laughs> undo all of our all of our tweaking to make it work just so that we could get something good at. So there is it's it's symbiotic, but it's not a one to one though. There is no as you say, there's no like this is the manpower needed to make an hour of game content. Because I remember um, they're like separate inside, things. Uh, inside Austin, uh, you, you said how long? It's a two and a half hour game, maybe. Austin, did you work on Inside? No, 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 no. no. We just, were just talking oh. about it a lot. And, and how long uh, did it take for them to make that? I think it was like seven years or something to make that game. No way. Although to quote to quote um, Andrea Pacino, because uh, I think he's probably right about this. His his assessment of that was, I think they had a functional gray box within six months, and then six <laughs> and a half years of absolutely perfect polish, because it's a yeah. game that has. No flaws. I, I mean, don't me, have any criticisms of Inside. Nope. And sometimes yeah. as well, you have to make three bad games to have the good game at the end of it. Like, there's a lot of, like, wasted time where you'll go, not with that game, but with definitely, again, with other games. Like, I mean, I think they'd only made Limbo and... beforehand. Yeah. I don't know that they'd No, I mean, no, no, no sorry. Like, I'm just, I, I mean, like, 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 you have to make three game. bad versions of yeah. that game before you actually arrive at the one where it's like, oh, this clicks. Like, the, Are... like the, the early demos of almost every game we've made, you wouldn't recognize them compared to what the final game was. That's by definition wasted work, but you have to, sometimes you have to go down those paths to find out what not to do so you can make the good thing. You know? there, yeah, I mean, every, every project I've worked on, there've been glimpses of that. I remember on Journey, there was even a brief flirtation of it being a four-player uh uh thing gun combat as well right there were lots of there (laughs) were like rifles (laughs) yes exactly it was very competitive and leaderboards um no but i remember um, oh no on um when i got hired on assassin's creed syndicate i remember they were about they hadn't announced the uh, release date yet but they were about a year from the release um a little less than that and I remember I pulled up all the, they were showing me, just giving me a tour through everything that like on the day that literally my first meeting, they're showing me, okay, here's what we've got so far. You know, here are a bunch of work in progress cinematics and all that. And I was blown away by how rough a lot of things were still, like they were very placeholder and, and they were also using the like, um, t- like type to speech sort of placeholder robot voices Lambs, to uh, everybody over here. Yeah, exactly. For all <laughs> the dialogue. Those. And I remember saying, you know, so I, I said, how long have you guys been been working on this so far? Because, you know, Ubisoft will have like these different parallel productions of, you know, the 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 um, the Montreal team will be working on one AC and then the the Quebec City team will be working on a different AC so that they're kind of staggered. And I said, you know, because I think I think um, Unity had only come out the year before. And I so wow. I was like, when did you start? This game, and they said, "Oh, you know, I can't remember now, but well, let's say two and a half, three years ago." And I was like, "Everything is so rough." And I was like, "What have you been doing all this? Stuff? Like, forgive my ignorance, but what the <laughs> hell have you been doing?" And they were like, 
basically building this. And then it's like the fly through a fucking fully fleshed out Victorian London where it's just we need a few years to just build the tech to support running around like getting on a horse in the middle of a city. Well, there's six months of work. Like, it's just insane. All those systems, because then it was like, OK, yeah, Paul, Amos and Victoria Atkin, let's flood them in at the last second now and populate their work throughout the game and get the music in at the last second and all that. Cause it just takes so long, I say last second, but that last year is where all the content really came to life because mm-hmm. years prior just to, cause the scope of it is mind bogglingly huge. Shadow of Mortar was the same way. Oh, yeah, sorry. You're go crackling ahead. homie. Yeah. <laughs> you are crackling again. Um, but I was going to ask you Austin in terms just of snap. like your involvement as a composer syndicate is obviously a way longer game than journey. Did they take dramatically different amounts of time to make? Apologies for the crackling. Um, I, uh, well, it's, I think that's a really hard apples to apples comparison. I'm sure Michael backed me up on this from a, from a specifically kind of a tech and dev standpoint, but I mean, journey much like, Mike's games, you know, that's, they made their own engine. That's a, that's a game. I mean, not to, not to, not to do that, but I'm saying, (laughs) I I know, I know. I'm just saying, um, I'm not a real uh, coder as the, as the YouTube comments. (laughs) uh, Yeah. That, that's one where, um, they are, they are starting everything from scratch. AC, they have specifically your involvement though, when it comes to composing it. Did I had way more time on journey than on syndicate, like three times more. Um, I was on journey, the entirety of development, which was three years. I, I literally, we, we joke around that on journey, uh, the first concept art was my theme, uh, because Genova Chen sat me down and said they flower had shipped like a week before. So journey had, was not officially greenlit. And he said, um, you know, but they had a three game contract with Sony. So it was presumed to be greenlit, but you still have to go through the motions and present it to Sony and say, here's what we want to make. And they have to officially give you the thumbs up. And so he said, you know, here's kind of what I have in mind for the game. And there's a whole story that I enjoy telling, but I'll skip it for now. But the long and short of it was that they gave me the the rundown of, of, of what the aspiration for the game would be and said, can you go kind of write some music? Cause Genova's whole thing. And, and I think it's kind of just a general, that game company idea was we like to use music as a kind of North star for the team more than any other particular element. Like where, where if, if we all agree how this music makes us feel, then that can help everybody know that they're on the right path. Like if you, if your artwork or your, you know, design or your, you know, whatever shaders, if everything feel, if it doesn't, if anything kind of deviates from the agreed upon emotion of this music, then you can know that you may be drifting since emotions Mm -hmm. are kind of, all that they care about it's reductive to say but it is a such a crucial thing genova works backwards from the way a lot of developers work just as a minor tangent because he'll very often a developer will think of a really cool mechanic or a great narrative conceit or something and say how do i turn that into a game and genova will think of an emotion and say what mechanics would make me feel that way and he Mm -hmm. has no aspirate there's no idea uh, ahead of time of oh it's going to be this kind of game that kind of game it's just i want to feel this and wherever i can find a a thing that makes me feel that way that's the game i'm going to make like in the case of journey it was i want to feel alone and then i want to feel connected with somebody in a way that has zero antagonism and zero rivalry and any of the kind of online competitive multiplayer sort of standard relationships. He's like, I want to, I want to find a way to feel like I care. I even love a total stranger. And so every decision and journey was how do we make a thing that feels that way? And so we had worked together on our first game flow a few years earlier. And so he just approached and said, are you interested in um, writing a theme? And I wrote a theme and Matt Nava had some concept art, you know, within a day or two and we were off and running and it was only three years later that it shipped. Whereas on syndicate, yeah, it was like, here's a mostly finished game, but with a lot of placeholder content. And then just, cause there was also three times, a third as much time, but three times more music in syndicate than yeah. in journey more than that. Uh, so yeah, there, it, but there's so many differences, you know, it's really uh, also yeah. journey. As Mike said, journey was a lot of like experimenting and failing a lot of, Let's try to do this. Okay, six months down that road, it's not working. Let's back all the way back to the starting gate and try again. Whereas Syndicate, it was like the sixth Assassin's Creed game. There were a lot of knowns and there were a lot of things we know work and things we're trying to improve upon and iterate on from overall as a franchise, from Unity or Black Flag specifically, et cetera, et cetera. So it's 
it's a really tough comparison. You have a lot of advantage going into a game like Syndicate. For sure. With Journey, did you know the length going in? Like, how do you know how they decided hmm. the length of that game? Because the Journey is especially short. Yeah, that was it. Was a big uh, kind of co- controversy. I, 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 Journey was overwhelmingly positively received, but it, th- the length of it seems to be the common thread amongst the dissenters. I mean, there's of course also the folks that are like. You know, there's no you don't do anything. So to hell with it. I, I you know, walking <laughs> walking simulator began as a hard pejorative, you know, uh, and um, and uh, and so it, there are people that just it's not for them in terms of the actual gameplay. But for a lot, especially because the price point became this discussion of like, well, this is really more of a 15 to 20 dollar game, even though, you know, it was. The budget was way over what it had originally specced out to be. And, and it took and, three years. And, yeah, it was three years instead of like a year and change. And and so there were multiple extensions and the team expanded. And and so there were a lot of um, uh, sort of discussions, most of which, I, of course, I wasn't in the room for, but I kind of am caught wind of secondhand. And mm-hmm. that, that, you know, they were like, well, we, we can't overprice this game for what it is. Um you know, it was supposed to be a PlayStation Network exclusive, all these kinds of like it was supposed to, you know, because back in those days, you know, there was still the novelty of the downloadable as as a thing. Like most games were still kind of primarily box titles. That was still that we're still at that transition point. So, yeah, it was it was um, it was uh, there were just a lot of kind of head scratching and anxiety about what to charge for it. And the length was, I think, a big thing of, you know, are people going to expect a longer game? at a higher price as opposed to a better game, you know, cause the, the people, the people, if you look through comments, especially in the early days on YouTube of let's plays where someone would go, I can't believe somebody wasted $15 on a game. That's an hour long or 90 minutes mm-hmm. at most 45 minutes. If you are brisk, you know, how can you waste your money? And, and then there would inevitably be a piling on of people saying, so somehow grinding for gear uh, for an extra three hours makes your money better spent. Like every moment of this game had meaning and purpose. There was no fat to trim. And isn't that like, wouldn't you rather spend something that's that meaningful? And I'm certainly in that camp, although Journey was a way to help me reveal that because I was a kind of traditional gamer, I think, growing up, you know, it was all about, it was all about the, the shooty shooty and stuff. Mm-hmm. Actually, I say that. I mean, like I was like Grim Fandango's like favorite game ever made. So I'm Hell totally yeah. caricaturing myself. Yeah. Uh, unduly. Not much shooty shooty there. No. Not much. Uh, although beautiful flowers that do result when you when you do a little bit of the shooty shooty. But uh, so yeah. <sighs> so in any case. Up, but yeah. Oh, it's great. So um, <laughs> anyway, I'm being overly long winded here. Uh, but yeah, I I think that game for me really brought to the fore the notion of how do we value dollars as a time factor because i i certainly perhaps brainwashed by the very biasing experience of working on that game and just how special and and career trajectory altering it was uh i have a lot of love for it and it really it really biased me in favor of the idea that dollars are spent uh in earnestness like if inside was half that long but that equally as polished as it is i would pay the same price because it's like quality for me, value is so much more valuable. Same yeah. for Supergiant. I, don't, I, don't I pay $60 for any of their games going forward because I know what their mm-hmm. games are having played their last three. So I would absolutely continue to do that. I uh, think but that's a very subjective. Well, yeah, and I think that's a very anomalous opinion too because I think that the continuing argument that I've heard, and I even put something up on Twitter about this too, where people are saying, we, we want to know what we're getting because no, people don't have just like people aren't, aren't as beneficial or, or as, as privileged as we are to be able to be given download codes or be given copies of the game. Yeah. It's like, or be able yo. to afford multiple games either. Right. Like, you like, know, I buy plenty why... of games still, but I can afford to do that. And so do I yeah. exactly. I'm the same way. So it's, it's, but there's a lot of people who's like, I can probably buy four or, yeah. uh, I don't, you know, my, my, I, uh, kind of depend upon my parents or grandparents or whatever to be able to give me that one gift for my birthday or for Christmas. And this is what I'm going to get. So I have to, I have to be very, very prudent about which title I get. So I understand it was like, if you was like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to turn in my card for this three hour game. Be like, ah. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's, there's this thing that I want to be, um, I want a 60 hour experience or I want a, just a continual thing that is going to be more event-based, like a Fortnite situation to where 
Hmm. It's just this perpetual giving kind of thing. Um, I, I just don't understand this blanket statement of they're too long or they're too short when it is, that's a subjective thing. It's salt in the sauce. It's like, what do you mean? And let the story, let, like, let the dev tell their story. Let the dev make their game. If you want to think it was too long, great. But that doesn't mean that, hey, we need to change the way that games are made because these are too long. These are too well, that's short. That's where I think it's especially interesting. I absolutely think you're right and that this should be a game by game basis. The part where it gets really interesting is where the dev has decided a length and then a publisher has told them, we need four more hours in this. And that's where you feel games are too long. I put Alien Definitely Isolation that in happen. my background because I, I believe that that was uh, an instance of that where Alien Isolation is very, 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 very good. And then there's another eight hours on top of what you think the climax is over and over and over again that I know some people didn't have a problem with. But for me, it was like, why do you keep giving me climaxes and keep giving me things that are written like endings? And then there's more game. It just like became draining and became a thing that I was like, let this be over. And I think that there are cases where that happens where it does feel like a publisher mandated we need more hours in this thing. And that's that I don't think true. I agree about alien it isolation. It totally though. is a thing. Yeah. I'm, but actually I'm, not I'm just saying like the publisher but. is actually the one that's, that's putting that on because to me, the publisher would be going scope, 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 scope. What's the cheapest that you can get this game done. And knowing that you're going to add eight hours of content is just, no, I think going, it's, I think it's the it other way around. It's a marketing thing uh, for sure. Like it's, it, people definitely want to have that good number for launch day. The Order like 1886 definitely. is an example of a game that I really liked that was too short and then just kind of didn't sell because people were like, what do you mean it's only it's like? It's a six hour game with no multiplayer or anything else. It's like, yikes. I mean, there's a lot like of, there's hours. a lot of behind the scenes there as to sure. how that happened that, that, that's probably to remain behind and the none scenes. none of us are, that, are, 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 you know, uh, competent but, enough to speak to it. Yeah, but I, I know that that was a challenging relationship um, um, between Ready Dawn and, and, and Sony. But um, as someone, as someone who, who, who actually did work on that game, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, um, the, there's a project I'm actually, I'm working on right now that I also can't speak about, but this exact conversation has, has come up where there it's, it's not that they want to find ways to make it cheaper and reduce scope. Like you were saying a second ago, Troy, it's that they're saying we've already spent this much and therefore, you know, to recoup on our investment, we think we want to target this price point. And if we're coming in noticeably below the kind of average runtime of games of this price point, we're not going to see a return on our investment. So it has to be longer just because the math is starting to not work. Man, and I, so I, I sympathize weird. with that. That's tough. I've actually that's... had the, I've had it at the, even at the like pitching stage where like there's, I'm thinking of one, one specific game and one specific publisher where we basically went in with, um, you know, a concise, in my opinion, kind of good game. It's a bits of it have ended up in our other games. I don't know if we'll ever actually make that game, but it's found its way into lots of other stuff, but it was a, a good indie game, four or five hours kind of where we normally sit with our games. And it, there was a price point attached to it. And that publisher said, we'll only work with you if we make this five times the budget and, and four times the length. And, and, and that in, in that room, in that moment, when someone across from you is is offering you more money than you've ever imagined having, and saying, "Please, you know, basically make a completely different scale of game," that's I can see totally why studios that that, that do that. We we chose not to um, because we had other opportunities and we kind of went in different directions. But like those moments exist, and there is it is it is a it's a it's a bullet point. It's a uh, an expectation. I think what's interesting is I feel like the conversation is maturing to a point where I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of editors because it's something games have never done. We've never no, we've never deleted lots of stuff from games. That doesn't that doesn't happen because you spend so much. Let me try. Let me clarify that just to <laughs> fix that facial expression of yours. Um, <laughs> there been a lot of there been a lot of Mike catalyzed Troy expressions in this. It's, <laughs> it's been a journey. We don't, we, we remove stuff because it's buggy. We remove stuff because it's not fun. We remove stuff because um, it doesn't fit. What we don't tend to do is literally kind of edit stuff out for narrative or um, pacing. 
It's not something I, I don't think is done. We don't take things to a point where they're built and finished. The the um, reason why I make that face is not to, I don't want to pull focus, but the, the reason why I, there's a, there's a studio that I worked on that there was a, a very, very big set piece. And they're like, here's the deal. We can either throw all the resources that we have on making sure that this thing is as good as and, and up to par with the rest of the game or the rest of the game will suffer because the rest of the game has to be made and they cut it. And this was a but that's a big script edit, piece. right? That's a script edit. That is no. a planning edit. No, that's they, a, that's they a, hadn't made it. They had made it. It was a design. It was it it impacted gameplay, narrative, design, everything. There were right, but what you're saying is it. that there was more work to do to get it finished, right? That was the reason they cut it was they couldn't finish it to a polished level. So yes. they, by definition, they hadn't finished it. But that's, that's what but, I'm saying. It's kind sure. of they were the previs. Oh, but you're saying phrase. everything is finished. We've shot everything essentially, right? We we've put yeah. everything in. and We're like. Nah, I'm going to take this out. Like, that's something that's real. Like, I think most developers would go, no, screw you. We spent a lot of money on that and a lot of time. And it's, right. it's Bob's level. We don't want to mess it. But there are definitely games where, as a player, I could stand to lose a few hours of that game. And my overall experience of that game would probably be better because those things were removed. The other thing that I think is really interesting and where um, I'm excited by some of the work that different studios are doing is making this a player choice. I, I've I've been saying it for a while, and I know this is blasphemy. I would love to be able to play the ten hour version of Witcher Three. I would, I would just just show me the okay. best bits of that game, edit the hell out of it. Mm. I'm not saying Witcher Three shouldn't be sixty hours for everyone who wants it to be, but I have not seen. I've not. I'm not going to finish. I've, I've played like the first location in that game and then stopped because I was like, that's taken me six hours, seven hours. I don't have. There's five other games I need to play. I have a you know job and and, and commitments and stuff to do. I, I would love that. I love, and it's something that, yeah, lots of games are getting very good at accessibility. We talked about it on the last episode, but, I, but right. one thing I wonder is if we're going to start seeing kind of time and editing being and scale being an option. I would spend the same amount of money for Witcher 4 as you would, but I would play the mode which just got me to the good stuff quickly. You know, I've, is that a thing? Is that, wow. a, is that a trend? Because I've never actually thought Neither about it. Oh, no, no one's or... done it. No one's no, done it. No, I don't think anyone's ever done it. Yeah. And I think players would actually, there'd be a really interesting reaction. I would sign I the players fuck would find up that. for that. I'm with you, Like an abridged version of the game? And then you can players come up with a Criterion collection and the unedited? <laughs> well, no, no, release it all. Release it all, Troy. Like, you release it all. Like But it's in the menu. You're like, I want the five-hour experience. I want the ten-hour experience. I like the idea of that, it's, even though oh, that would make it no. so complicated for no. digital. Historically, okay. Okay. historically, players have hated this because it, it devalues the work they're putting into the game. But what's fascinating about the accessibility discussion and what I think has shifted, I'm going to let you talk a second try, I promise. <laughs> I think what's shifting is I think players <laughs> are gaining the kind of understanding and maturity to not worry. Like there are, like in Last of Us 2, there's loads of accessibility features that make the game quote unquote easier you know if you're someone who doesn't need those accessibility features you can make the game as easy as you want it to be so it basically doesn't quite play itself but you can simplify everything you don't have to aim the gun in last of us 2 you can just switch on the thing that auto aims and you don't ever have to worry about aiming your left thumbstick that's brilliant that opens the game up to a broader audience it's brilliant it's fun sure. it's cool Two, three years ago, players would have been on the forums complaining that that devalued their experience and they were, you know, people, you know, get good. People shouldn't be able to play the game like this. But players aren't really talking about that or I'm not seeing much of that. I wonder if we're heading towards a point where players are going to accept like, no, you know, Mike and Austin want to play Witcher 4. They don't want to put in the time I'm going to put in. Let them have their version. That doesn't devalue my version. I get to have the quote unquote real proper experience, but they get the, the fun tourist version. More Go on, Troy, people. I'm wrong, right? No, 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 yeah. not at all. More people, I think you're dead on. More people are experiencing games by not playing them than they are playing them. So any interaction with the game is, is a tremendous, <laughs> you know, a, a uptick in, in engagement. I, I just think that I, I I remember specifically if you've ever seen the kid stays in the picture or read the book uh, the the biography autobiography really of of Bob Evans, um, big Hollywood producer that produced you know movies like The Godfather Chinatown it, it's incredible. He tells the story where he goes Francis Coppola comes in and you've to the told screening. this story Have on I told this, this story? show. Have I? Yeah. Uh, well, tell it again because we right. love it. For this I'm gonna I'm gonna be like I'm gonna be like uh, River at the end of Serenity. This show right gets now. new listeners every week, Austin. This is this is the point let, of the let, story. Let's do the origin story. The it's point not of the that story I have it. I just that... love to hear you tell it. <laughs> after 
after Wait, you know an hour and a half, the the lights come back up and the reel runs out. And Bob Evans looks at Francis and he goes, "You shot an epic and you turned it into a trailer. Give me the rest of my fucking movie." And I think that if you gave this, especially. I, imagine the disparity between the reviews that people would get and the experiences people would have. It was like, that game was shit. It was like, well, did you get to the aliens? You're like, what? You no. Nah, yeah, if you play the five really important. Yeah, I understand. Like, narratively, that is a minefield, especially when it comes oh, to. Oh, it's a terrible idea. Like, to be clear, to it's be clear, like, I don't think anyone should necessarily do this. I, but, but it's one of those things, and this is, this is, I think I've said this on the show as well. We're doing all our hits in design <laughs> and game development. Star Wars. Every, everything. Yes, Mandalorian. How awesome. <laughs> everything is stupid and impossible right up until you see it appear in three games in one year. Like, and there's, you know, there, this is the kind of thing where, like, I'm talking about it and I kind of want to try putting it in my next game because I think it's a, it could be, it could fail miserably. Right. But imagine if it worked. Like, we, I mean, we I... It, we, we had it in subservice. So in subservice circular, it's like a text-based game and we have like scrolling text. And we have one feature in that game, which is um, the text scrolls kind of at auto speed. And the first person you talk to, you've had a chat with them for 10 minutes. They say to you, sorry, am I talking too fast? And you get to choose kind of to like, you can recalibrate basically right. the speed at which speech happens in the game. That feature took like an afternoon and so many players just love that and say, oh, it's so cool that you can kind of adjust how the, how the game... And you can basically turn... Uh, you know, a, a two-hour game into a two-and-a-half-hour game by slowing it down, or an hour game by speeding it up, and just stuff like that. Just, I think players really respond well to it. I think it'd be a fun thing to to experiment with, and I'm definitely talking myself into trying this in the no, future. Games there's right a, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think there's a, um, there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, interesting spin-off discussion that that leads to that your Godfather comparison also kind of taps into Troy of the idea of the thing that fundamentally separates games from all other media is the invitation of the player to, to be an active participant and to not just sit in a chair and say, let me, let me tell you a story. Let me take you on an adventure, et cetera, et cetera. So it, to me, the assertion of the, like the authorship of, of Coppola and, and, and everybody else involved in the Godfather is sort of expected in the medium of film because it's like, this is not a two-way relationship. This is, I mean, on some levels it is, but it is essentially a passive mm -hmm. consumption of like, I'm gonna sit in my chair and watch this film. Right. And, and this, I remember the first time this ever came up was actually on my very first game, Flow, with Kelly Santiago, where we got into a debate uh, of, should it be allowed for the player to kind of like, Spotify didn't exist then, but to kind of, anachronistically mess up my story it, on a game like flow where the music and sound design are, are half the game experience uh, because it's just so kind of Zen and meditative by nature. Uh, sh should the player be able to kind of like toggle a thing in the menu that just integrates some Spotify playlist into it of their, of their choosing. I think, and I on said the her, game. well, and I said to her, that's kind of where I'm at now. But I said, I, at the time, I was like, what? No, we are we are providing an authored experience. And this is kind of like what you were saying last week about The Last of Us. Like, I don't care if you ultimately don't like it insofar as I care that I have fairly represented the story I want to tell or the experience I want to create. And her response was, we're, the experience we're trying to create, though, is one in which the players have agency. And why not just extend that agency even into some foundational elements of the gameplay itself? And it really, it's like tormented me for 15 years now because I'm like, shit, it's true. Like maybe my my entire contribution to a game could theoretically be superfluous if a player said, look, I John Wick Hex, I mean, fucking awesome, but I would rather play Tyler Bates music while I But I mean, bluntly, like uh, the second all of game developers about 10 years ago all agreed to put like a music volume separating the settings by that at that moment play music became a player choice like we have to and there are lots of players who play with them all the yeah. time so for every review at ign music has to go completely off which means that when i'm capturing gameplay there is no sound why uh, uh licensing problems so where we have so like when i'm reviewing the so game, you're reviewing the game, game i'm still listening to the audio oh, it's when i'm okay, capturing okay. which i ge okay. you'll generally like do you're afterwards because you're like i need to capture these moments for the editor for the it's because reviewer. of the youtube monetization uh issues mm. yeah you, you can get a strike so uh, the, the christian contemessa who was i think lead designer on uh red dead not not red dead 2 but red dead redemption um 
And he was also the lead writer, lead narrative writer, and the director for Shadow of Mordor, the first one. Said something that's really, really stuck with me. He said, we can make the mistake of thinking that the player is a writer. And the player is not a writer. The player is an editor. We provide the content and they edit. So whenever we go, what do you think, player? It is actually an illusion of agency in a perfect sense that like a telltale game. You're not writing your story. You're choosing of the ones of the bucket of things that we give to you. But ultimately, we're going to we're going to make this thing come down to a T and it's going to tell the story that we want to tell. You just get to have some agency as you go along. So I think when you say, well, we want to extend that that agency to the player, it's like, yeah, but like you said, you're creating an authored experience. There's a difference, and we can make a mistake of turning players into writers, and they're, they suck as writers. They're not we supposed literally to had be that, writers. We literally had that debate like last week. We're, we're at a point with one of our projects where like we're looking in the script, and there's a moment, a big, big moment in the story where... Um, where I've written it in a linear way, it's a story event that occurs, and one of the people who was checking out the script and kind of giving me feedback said, "Could could that be a player choice? That feels like a moment where a player could choose an angle." And the response was from me was, "Is is the other choice as interesting? Like, is the other choice we've got a choice in this script, which is a cool story moment? Or sorry, a character makes a choice, the player doesn't." If we give the player control over that, are they going to, if they choose the other one, is that as interesting? And the answer is definitely no. And that was a really interesting moment, which illustrates exactly what you're saying. I'm kind then of, we don't make it a choice. And I, yeah, and I think that's true. That's what's also really interesting in the conversation around editing um, games is you can play games at a, like you're choosing the pace of a game by the pace you run through. It was really interesting to me playing Last of Us 1 again recently. I slapped it on easy mode because I was just, I want to see the story again. I want to refresh myself on the on the stuff. I want to get every reference when I play Last of Us 2. I just want to breeze through it. I think I enjoyed it more playing it through again on easy mode than I had playing on like hard mode when it came out because I'm a stealth nerd. I was playing it probably. I loved playing that game with the aesthetics of survivors and the aesthetics of being in a dangerous situation, but never running out of health kits. I had a really sure. good time. I got through it like Taylor five hours and had a great time. These days to that. Yeah. I play every first person shooter on hard because I like playing a first person shooter where I have to like be very reflexive and I can die immediately. Um, but a lot of action adventures, if there's a boss fight that's annoying me, I will drop it down easy, which I never used to do. I used mm -hmm. to play everything on hard. And now I like am willing to, if the tools are there, tailor it to how much I'm enjoying a particular thing. So if I don't yeah. like the boss fight and it's difficult, I'm like, I'll drop it down to easy. I don't care. Ninja and Gaiden I 3. you editing. I would have done that. If, that. if that had been an option, I would have dropped that down because I never finished that game because the final boss fight is just <laughs> bullshit. But like... Uh, that's right editing now, though. Go ahead. Go on then. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say that that's editing. And, and with Last of Us 2, I, I was playing it earlier. I'm, I'm having some time off work at the moment, so I'm just burning through Last of Us. And finally, after not playing it before our spoiler conversation, that was fun. Um, the but like I was running, I was running through a space earlier, and there was you know there were two buildings. I went in one. I'd done the whole finding all the collectibles. And I was I was looking at the other building, and there was a, a story moment off to the right. I knew, I you know know the games well enough to know if I run right, I'm going to hit the story moment. And I looked at the building, and I was like. I actually don't care what's in that building. I just want to get to the cool story thing. I'm I'm going to choose not to. So I missed a piece of content, which is something that like, as a player, I feel like we're, we're, we're very much trained to like explore every corner, do everything, kind of get on, get our money's worth, right? And, ex and see every nook and cranny. And it was a weird moment where I was like, I'm choosing not to engage with a piece of content. Probably someone put a lot of work into that house and there's probably a cool story in there that I missed out on. In this and game I in particular, care. there's an yeah, unbelievable exactly. amount of depth to this stuff that's off the critical path. Jesus, it's crazy. But that's so interesting. much, that's... man. There's a whole other and, but, game to be played. But that's cool. If, How yeah, many but people that, do you guys think finished... Uh, what do you think the completion rate for The Last of Us Part Two is? I looked it up. 60%. I can... 30% across the board. On most games, I would, I'm going to guess that Last of Us is maybe a little lower than the 30%, so 20%. That's actually, I was going to guess like even lower than 20. I was like teens. Too. I was going to be like probably 20% because it's really long and it can mm. be very harrowing. The completion rate mm -hmm. for The Last of Us Part 2 is 55%. What's up, y'all? That is incredible. What, that is, I, I already 30%, 30 yeah, It's barely been out like, for two weeks. Uh, uh. 
55 the only reason above, why I say that is because if, yeah. the people that are playing it are playing it and it's yeah. it's it's not like Red Dead where you where it's it's an incredible game people are like ah this is right. and you just kind of fall off and here's but, the thing with that mm-hmm. game Troy and and this is a really Fuck interesting off. part of this conversation that that's really impressive so when we say or if, if someone feels like the last of us part two is too long and I had moments where I was like I feel like this drags I fully understand what you were saying last week Troy and also very much respect it in the same way I respect Majora's Mask actually is that the length and the struggle of playing through it and of feeling like how is this still going perfectly mimics what the characters are going through, which is the opposite of ludonarrative dissonance, right? So like, I feel like that that is a very effective uh, use of that. But a thing with The Last of Us Part Two that I feel like um, people might be saying it's too long is because this is a game that is so easy to play. And that's what I said from the start. I have trouble putting it down that you're just playing it mm. for really long chunks of time when you play it. That's true. Whereas there are other games that you play, play for an hour and then put down. I only play Animal Crossing for 20 minutes and then I never play it again. So even though I put 300 hours in, I don't say Animal Crossing is too long. It's because if something is particularly engaging, you can feel like you've spent way too much time playing it, which is on you and not necessarily on that game. And I imagine that's happening with The Last of Us Part Two. If 55% mm. of people who've played it have finished it and it only came out last friday or well, i guess it will have been two that's a crazy good published. stat like it's I worth know. repeating for anyone like watching this like 30 percent is like the generic standard i think most of my games come in it's at crazy. like 35 40 percent and i'm proud of that i expect yeah. like, it sounds Way like a failure lower. but like that's yeah I'm, like the I'm idea really of a game being 55 is amazing i'm really curious to see what the conversion rate was because they had anticipated um that they were probably going to have about a 15 to 20 percent conversion rate from people that played Last of Us Part One to to Last of Us Part Two, mm. and I was like, "That's insane!" I, I would thought the conversion rate was like same thing, like seventy, eighty percent. They were like, "Oh no, we think it's going to be one of the best conversion rates we've ever had, and we're still 85, 80 to eighty five percent of the people will never have played the first part." And I was like, "That's that is so baffling to that's me, bonkers to me." So I'm curious to see if if their completion rate is is, is that truly remarkable. Um, if the conversion rate ended up being the same way. You know, sure. yeah, um, I don't know that I could look that up though, but the, I mean, the trophy the thing source? listed up publicly. Uh, it's literally, you can look up like trophy, trophy skimming trophy kind of thing. Rates. Yeah. yeah. Which is super interesting um, to look at. And, and I know dying light was a game that had a really high completion rate. And I was always found hmm. that one really interesting. Cause I also finished that game. That makes uh, sense though. And it was just like, I just fucking love playing through that game. I don't know why. Like, I feel like maybe that was uh, in credit to its pacing and that that game is really fast paced. Like uh, the the way that you run around the city is so much fun. Like it was just a lot of people wanted to finish mm. Dying Light for some reason. And yeah, Last of Us Part 2 being 55%, or it was, 50, it was 53.69 exactly, is, is like crazy surprising considering the length and how people are complaining about it being too long. But again... So like part of that might be that that's just because it's a game we're playing very quickly, so it feels longer I also, than it might otherwise. The, the number I'm interested in as well is in six months because I think yeah, I yeah. wonder if right now because it's very zeitgeisty. I wonder, and not to put a spoiler, obviously it's amazing, but like I wonder if that number comes down once it becomes not the thing you have to have an opinion on. I wonder if that will kind of spoilers if is it also will, a thing. if people, who, people yeah, want exactly. to get through if, a like, game like that, so it's not spoiled for them. True. If in a couple of months, when people uh, who are not like reason. out of the gate into it, what when they when they come in, if that number kind of comes down and reverts towards the mean, but still, it's very it's super impressive. It's a shame we don't know the conversion. I don't think the conversion numbers would be public unless how I would find unless that. Sony made them. Yeah. No, I, I, I guess you could you be. could skim. Can you skim? Can you skim like PlayStation accounts and like look for basically people who own both games on their accounts? Does I'm, that? I, I'm talking about me as a yeah. consumer. I don't think so. As a consumer. I mean, in the indie in the indie space, there's a. There's I'll check a after the show if I can do that to and like see if I can update what you data first. you can this figure out publicly. Yeah, this is some so. MI6 NSA shit. That people are talking about <laughs> no, it's worth it's, it's 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 actually worth kind of mentioning. Like that's actually a really that's a big part of like because we because indies so Sony obviously they have all the numbers on every game that's ever released on PlayStation. They right, right, right. All the users, they can they can really figure out, like, they can... And I've had the conversations with Sony where they're like, we know your games sell like this, and we know that this will do this, and we know that games... The, the 10 games that came out in your genre uh, at this time of year last year, this is this is rough. Obviously, they don't share private information, but they'll say, this is where we think you're going to... And they're, they're very... They do a lot of analysis. They're very into it. Mm-hmm. Um, as an indie, obviously, I only know about my games. I, on, I only know all the data about games we've made and shit, right? right? 
so in the indie space often yes there's a lot of like sharing people asking questions like oh well 100 on the down low like ask someone who's made something i'm in the same genre as my upcoming game go like do you think this is going to do all right how's this how's, how's this work how's the numbers work well that's but also there's a lot of skimming there's a lot of like that's what steam spy was like there's yeah. a lot of let's find the public data and let's try and find patterns within it and sometimes that's a bit of a nonsense thing sometimes the the data is really bad that you get back from it but there's there are people who spend a lot of time trying to figure out like there's there's people who have relatively are relatively sure, sure that they can tell how well a game is going to sell on launch day based on how many wish lists it gets or also right. how many games has a game on steam sold by looking at how many reviews it's had because and, and that's actually something i can back up like all of our games basically you, you can you can you know the number of like how many people buy a bithel game and then review it so therefore you you could look at our numbers if you knew that number based upon and reviews you could figure that all out yeah on how that. many reviews there are that's that's like so the a, interesting you do a lot thing. Of that, isn't it? You figure it out. There's a lot of uh, of, of terms that are, are lauded and thrown out there that I think the general public don't understand. Like the difference is like, oh, this game shipped 10 million copies. And people are like, wow, it <laughs> sold 10 million. It's like, no, 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 no. It shipped 10 million. We don't know how many it sold. It's like, well, we should know mm-hmm. how many it sold. It's like, you're not a shareholder. You're not privileged to that information. Um, the Well, the other, the, the other one that's brilliant is Thomas Was Alone sold 2 million units. How much for though? Not ten dollars uh, yeah, a yeah, unit, yeah. right? Yeah, like <laughs> twenty million. No, right. no yeah, I remember bundles. And, yeah, uh, humble yeah. bundle. Uh, more than more than one of my games has like hundreds of thousands of extra units. If on Steam Spy, uh, due to a single humble bundle sale back yeah, in the day. Yeah. Uh, well, it's every yeah. every game that was in the uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, bundle that was on Itchy. Weren't there like that, over a thousand games or something? It had a thousand games, but I think it sold like a, a million copies or whatever. Yeah. So literally every game in that bundle, million units game. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard yeah, to great. to get an understanding <laughs> of that. And uh, I have to yeah. go in about five minutes. Sorry to cut you guys short, but um, oh sorry. The other half of this that I I like feel very passionately about, but also don't want every game to do, um, is I always want games to have more player agency. Like that is the thing in writing that I'm very invested in. Is like the idea that we have. Like Naughty Dog make a very specific kind of game. They make a very cinematic game. And I absolutely don't want them to stop making the kind of game that they are good at making. But I also want to see more games where, uh, like Cyberpunk, which I played last week, or the week before, I don't even know what, what day it is anymore. The camera was never taken away from me once. Actually, it was hmm. once. But only one time for about two seconds to look at a drone and then to let me look wherever I wanted that whole time. And I feel like that, uh, in terms of something feeling too long, is has a huge impact uh, because you feel like you're in control of absolutely everything that's happening. And I think where the games uh, where you have to, like, I mean, Quantum Break's a really, really good one for this. You literally have to put the controller down and watch a TV show. It feels like it lasts longer because you're watching things rather than actually constantly contributing to things. And I think that gives you a different sense of this is too long. This is not too long because you don't have control. I very much mm-hmm. advocate for uh wanting games that do give us more player agency rather than having set pieces. Again, not to say I want to get rid of the ones that don't do that. I just want more variety in it. And I'm curious mm-hmm. to see as we, are there are several games that I know that, that are in development that are trying to do this, which is a, instead of having a cutscene, we just fix what Half-Life 2 did where you can do whatever you want in a scene, but we're not going to let you jump all over people like an idiot. You'll be locked into something, but you still have full control over the camera. So say you're talking to someone uh, and braiding their hair at the same time. So it's, you're still interacting with things while something is happening. And I I wonder how much of an influence that approach to game design will have on the idea that certain games feel like they're too long. Do they not feel as long if you have more player agency or more control? Or is it exactly the same? Like, I genuinely don't know. (laughs) Even even Last of Us Two does does that a bunch of times where you're it's walking and talking and and you're navigating the scene, but I can't draw my gun and I can't like craft a med kit in the middle of this conversation Forced because walk, you know yeah you can't even change the, the how quickly you're you're walking or you yeah, gears exactly. of war this thing in gears of war <laughs> yeah. is yeah. Yeah. Time loading it's a bit different. <laughs> Yeah, no, Last of Us, I feel like, does that in a, in a very strong way with, like, I, I feel like I may have said it last week, but that's how you learn why Abby got buff and how. It's like, yeah, you anyone who was mad about that, you missed it because it's it's literally in the gameplay. It's not in the cutscenes that leaked. Uh, that's a really good example. And, yeah, I, I just feel like that we're going to see more and more games. And, again, I know of a few that are trying to do this. Dying Light 2 is actually trying to do this, mm. where it's more about player agency or more about letting you have interaction over the cutscenes rather than taking the camera away from you. Cyberpunk, I played four hours, it didn't have a single cutscene. 
And that felt really odd, um, especially even compared to The Witcher 3, where basically every conversation you have is effectively a cutscene and that you're looking at Geralt, you're looking at another person, you're looking at Geralt, you're looking at another person. It's scary. It's it's scary to give you all that control of honor. I love I love the people who are doing it, but it's terrifying. Like I mean, there, there was an example of like I was uh, I was driving a car and there was a, a police chase or some kind of car chase to the side that I didn't really look at, and the designer that I was talking to was like, "That took me um, about two years," and I didn't even really look at it. It might have been two months, whatever it was. It was a long time, but I didn't yeah, even look. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, "There what? are studios right now that are actively working on can we do a narrative experience without doing any kind of cinematic thing that is not first person." Um, mm. When you do first person, that's easy to do, right? But when you're when you're telling a third person action adventure story, there's just this natural assumption that you'll put that within a cinematic space, and they've they've explored and they're trying to now expand upon. The system that they already found to proven to be, um, first of all, uh, effective, but also is incredibly more cost effective because you no longer have to do this big cinematics mm-hmm. are expensive and uh, they're expensive to shoot. They're expensive to put in your pipeline. They're just they're very, very expensive. So you can keep everything in game and have it just kind of be like, here's a cinematic moment, but you're still on the stick and then you kind of keep going. Um, Troy, how many hours of mocap did you record for part two? I mean, we shot, me personally? Yeah. Somebody asked me that yesterday. I think I ta- I shot a total of six days. If I'm, if that, that's not including being in the booth and doing VO, because there's a lot of walk and talk stuff that we did. But um, I, I think all in, I, I, was, I was only on set for about six days. Now they obviously shot, I mean, my God. Sure. There's, I think there's three hours of cinematics that are in the game. Do you um, only do the mocap on the cinematics? Do you do you do Joel's walk for cert, for example, or is that oh, all yeah. handled by the animation? So team? like on on part one, there we did a whole move set. So it's crouches right. and, and stands and walks and and everything else. And so even like when you mm-hmm. see Ellie and stuff stand there, and like she, her idols and stuff, like she'll scratch the back of her neck. That's one hundred percent Ashley doing that. Really? Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's like how it always we, feels very cohesive. So mm-hmm. I wondered if that was how it was done. Yeah, that's great. Same thing with Abby. That's something that is like look if mm-hmm. now if there's big vaults and stuff like that they want to get as much as they can with you but then at the end of the day we're going to look pretty goofy doing that and it's far better to bring in people there was one thing that we did in uncharted 4 where uh, sam is doing this one arm hang and i really really wanted to do it and they needed to get my face for it as well i found out that it's incredibly hard to do a one armed hang um so i did what i could and then they got my stunt double to come in and did a badass version of it uh so hooray for stunt people (laughs) yeah um, all right, so we have to wrap up, but I, it did just occur to me that next week would be episode 20, which in theory we should do is live. supposed to be live. We should do live. Um, so we'll supposed figure out the be. schedule is for that. that a, and is that the, the rule in our bylaws? We, we said it That's by supposed tens. to be every 10, yeah. So I'll, do you I'll figure not out remember the schedule the blood for that, oath. tweet it out, and I'll, oh, and I'll, I'll pin yeah, the comments. He doesn't know the handshake either, by the way. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> he doesn't know. Well, I'm out of the, I'm out of the coffee elbow, club, elbow too. foot, nose. Because <laughs> we can't. I guess nose would blow the whole COVID thing, wouldn't it? Oh, <laughs> um, we <laughs> definitely know, had a navigate. lot of requests to do a, like a proper spoiler cast for The Last of Us Part 2. I told people, I don't know if that suits the show. Um, but Mike, do you think that there's even a chance that you have the game finished by Mike D. next week? <laughs> Mike D. <laughs> I. Where are you at? Where are you at? I can tell you. Where are you? I at? mean, if I'm, not, I tell you what, we'll do this. If I'm not, I will politely sit out, and you guys can do it because I, I think people want it now. I don't want to be the. I don't want to delay it. So, I'm. Um, where am I at? I. Uh, I'm in S- S- Seattle day two. So I've got ways to go. Oh, the fu- okay. Ways to yeah, go. you do have a way. Yeah, the first yeah. time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you're, you're, bye-bye. We'll Bye. figure it out, and yeah, I'll, leave a, I'll leave a pinned comment to update everyone on that um, yeah. as well. So yeah, we should be live next week. I'll tweet it out and all that good stuff. Uh, we'll see you then, everyone. Bye. Bye.